Whether you like yours steamed or soft shell, a crab cake or in soup. I don't see how anybody can get through a summer without eating crabs. Maryland's favorite summer staple is becoming more of a luxury. Now it requires, you know, just much more money. From grocery store shelves to almost any restaurant menu in Maryland, the prices are way up. We almost seen double the price, over double the price on that from last year's. The Rusty Scuppers general manager, Julian Demiri, says these are some of the highest prices they've seen. A jumbo lump crab cake is $29. The dinner entree, $59. They've even added a new note on their menu. These are 75% of all the items we sold at Russell's Copper has some crab-related uh, uh, dishes. So this is really affecting affecting you and your your prices. Is it affecting how customers are ordering? Are they sticking with crab cakes or are they choosing other items? Uh, you know, that is shocking, actually. We thought that would affect the customers. But I tell you, uh, the customers have been very supportive and very understanding of the whole situation. We had it on the menu and actually... Actually, those items actually have been higher than anything else. I would say it's hard on a lot of, you know, Marylanders. They're going to buy them, but not as often. Yeah, they're still going to want to have crabs sometime. At the Rusty Scupper, they're not expecting prices to go down anytime soon. We absorbed some of the prices, too. It's a double blow on top of the cost of COVID. Demiri thinks that a labor shortage is partly to blame. Mostly uh, the shortage of the pickers, of the picker workers. I think we think it's a transportation issue too. And on top of that, it comes with the supply demand situation. More people are dining out, but the supply isn't catching up to the demand. Shelley Orman, Fox 45 News. They're creating undue stress for city residents, wondering what will happen if they don't pay the money they, the city says that they owe. Riel Creighton joins us live with that story, Riel. And Mary, those are difficult questions to answer. There are known issues with the system, which is perhaps why some of those people we know have those sky high water bills have not had their service interrupted. And then there are those who are not receiving a bill at all. The mayor's office reportedly saying that that money, that revenue in the millions is lost to the city. They're the stories of a water billing system in crisis. When you're trying to do right, things like this happen to you. It's just not right. A flood of emotions for a woman with a bill approaching $24,000 for a bedbound senior. First, I, I, I didn't believe it. I looked at the address again. Nearly 3000 This is somebody's water bill for the whole block. Water bills are an example of just gross incompetence and ineptitude by the city. Former candidate for Baltimore Mayor Theroux Vignaraja says the city can't seem to get a grip year after year on the problem, despite audits and huge investments. The city has such a whack-a-mole approach to these problems. They think they can throw some money at this problem. They can patch in some new system, not realizing that there is a fundamental systemic ineptitude and incompetence that plague so many of these agencies. An inspector general's report found after spending tens of millions on smart meters, system upgrades promised to deliver more accurate bills, 22,000 meters now broken, and no one can seem to explain exactly why. This from DPW in March. It can sometimes be a needle in a haystack to find what the issue is. A sweeping audit initiated in 2019 after the city failed to collect more than two million from the luxury Ritz-Carlton residents in Federal Hill for more than a decade. Yet for others with massive charges, the problems remain. People just don't understand sometimes what, you, what you're dealing with. The new administration deserves some time to try to address and tackle this longstanding problem, but it's really demoralizing. And we know that some viewers have actually stepped in to help some of the people with water billing issues that we have profiled. Valerie Hooker, for instance, that bedbound senior had her bill paid off by one of our viewers, that $3,000 bill. In the meantime, the administration, the mayor's office has promised to tackle the issue with urgency, but it is an issue that dates back many, many years. Baltimore City's using eminent domain to try to force people from their homes here on Sarah Ann Street in Baltimore's Poppleton neighborhood under a deal brokered 20 years ago with a New York company. The historic alley houses are slated for demolition, neighbors for displacement. Baltimore Heritage supports the families here in Poppleton. We're telling the city no to this intentional 
displacement and demolition. Krista Green is chair of Baltimore Heritage's board of directors. The group just posted this video on their website, delving into the history of the homes, which were built in 1870, just after the Civil War. They are one of the very few rows, intact rows that are standing, and they're in good shape. They're special because of their colors. If you're looking behind me and saying, is that Amsterdam? The answer is no, it's West Baltimore. Historians say the city used to have 6,000 alley houses, but due to clearance policies and vacancies, only a fraction remain. The other thing, and maybe the third thing that makes these really special, is they've been occupied by African-American Baltimoreans uh, from the very beginning. Many have lived here for generations, like Sonia Eady. It's only one black left, you know, and so if you can just take this block off. It's the only thing that's left. They don't need my house for them to build on Mulberry Street. The development is part of an $800 million plan to build new homes, rental units, and commercial properties. Edie's not fighting the development, but doesn't want her home and history destroyed. We must find a way to do it that doesn't evict the neighborhood's long-standing residents and destroy their irreplaceable homes. Fighting the city on eminent domain is hardly easy. Thus far, if you equate this fight to boxing, they've fought to a draw coming into the final round, which is to say each side has taken a lot of blows, but has a lot of points to their name as well. Look, the city has a valid argument to make. You're talking about the, the, the betterment of the general populace. You're talking about something for the common good. You're trying to establish your standards. On the same token, in the other corner, in the black trunks, you have the community, which is saying, hey, listen, this has historical significance. It's always been under good preservation and steady care. This is not a dilapidated building, nor is it necessarily in a dangerous part of town. We meet all the checks in the boxes that we have to do in order to be able to preserve this. Public relations expert Doug Eldridge, who's also an attorney, says from a public relations standpoint, the campaign resonates. When you consider that most of these are publicly elected officials, the court of public opinion has increasingly important bearing Right, on the approval levels and any subsequent re-election campaigns that might happen in the in the near or far term. So of course the public pressure and the public sentiment in the, in the proverbial court of public opinion matters in something like this. It's not the kill shot, it's not going to be the thumb on the scale that determines the result, but it does have an impact. In Poppleton, Shelley Orman, Fox 45 News.